later geïnteresseerden. Toch? Ja, dus wat je doet is voor de eeuwigheid. Ja. Ja. Be careful. <laughs> Dankjewel, Teun. Be careful. Ja. Ah, Maurice.
Good afternoon and welcome. The famed philosopher Hannah Arendt reportedly once said that you can change the world or you can understand the world, but you can't do both. Perhaps by this she meant that being a good scientist is in tension with being a good activist. Because after all, a good scientist is always looking to understand the world. And understanding the world means always learning that the world doesn't quite work the way you thought it did. It means engaging with the reality that the world is more complex than you thought it was, that you were wrong, that there are alternative ways of understanding the situation that we are in that must be considered. You always have to be open-minded willing to embrace different narratives, because after all, science proceeds through falsification, through paradigm shifts. And so a good scientist is always looking at the weakest arguments that are there. A good scientist is always trying to prove himself wrong, because that's how you get to a better understanding. Well, if that's what a good scientist is, that's in tension with being a good activist because a good activist is committed to a narrative, and a good activist is trying to ch get people to follow their way of thinking, is convinced and, and passionate about what they believe, and trying to always put the strongest arguments forward. And that means that if you are a good scientist, you're maybe a bad activist. And if you're a, bad activi a good activist, you might be a bad scientist. The fate of the scientist is the fate of the eunuch. Whatever wisdom and power we have depends on our being made impotent. Or so you might say, because there's another way of looking at this. As scientists, we are looking at truth. And truth demands action. It will be hypocritical and, and lame to spend all our time and energy trying to figure out the truth as we see it, to get to the reality that we live in as uh, rigorously as possible, and then to not act on that. That would be a betrayal of our responsibility, and it would be a failure to be professors, because that's what the pro in professor stands for, to be some in favor of something, to speak about what you truly believe in. And if we don't want to use our knowledge and our insight to change the world, then who can? These two ideas about the relationship between being a scientist and being an activist are something that every scientist has to deal with from time to time. And that is why the Maastricht Platform for Community Engaged Research and the Platform for Research Ethics and Integrity decided to organize this event under the title, Can Scientists be activists, to explore this tension and have a conversation about how these two paradigms of, of being, of living in the world, relate. We have a wonderful panel for you, uh, three people who have a vision about this relationship with Professor Pre Martens, Astrid Ockelmans, and Maurice Sehers, who is at home, who will be giving you their vision. And then we will have a discussion about these issues. Uh, and I hope people at home will be wanting to participate. Um, please put any questions that you may have in the chat. The chat is being moderated next door in Studio 2. Um, and we're trying to get as many questions as possible to really get a discussion going. So as we go through this presentation, please keep the questions coming. And I look forward to including them in the discussion that we're going to have afterwards. Because you know, without conversation, we can't really get any further. To kick us off, I'm very happy to, uh, that we have with us Professor Fia Martins, uh, Professor of Sustainable Development and freshly minted Dean of University College Venlo. Congratulations on that, by Thank the way. You. Um, you call yourself a scientist, which I think is a contraction between scientist and activist. And if I, I go to your website, www.piamartins.com, 
bit of free advertising for you there. Um, you'll see that you know you write all these these uh, blog posts to really engage with activist discussions. So I'm very anxious to hear how you look at this tension that I sketched. Thank you very much, uh, Tun. Well, I uh, put on some slides, and um, if you look at the first slide, especially the, the picture uh, top uh, uh, left, you see a picture that I think every scientist would recognize. You have devoted the majority of, the, of your life to a scientific uh, area. Um, you have worked on it quite hard, but you're not able to get your message across the bigger audience. And I think this holds for every sciences, not only the fundamental sciences, but probably even more so for research on complex issues like climate change, biodiversity loss, and also research on the current corona pandemic. And I think it's quite funny that if you see that a society, like everywhere in Western Europe, all over the world, that has a huge interest in research, that values education and scientific research a lot, that invests lots of money in academia, uh, and still, if you come up with results that are not that handy, sometimes they are just dismissed by governments, by policymakers. And I think that's very strange. And of course, many scientists are to blame as well. And there are a lot of scientists that are not able to, to uh, get their main message across. Mm -hmm. They work on their own scientific square centimeter, and that's it. And they're also being stared by the perverse system of academic publishing. Hey, you only publish your work mainly in academic peer-reviewed journals. So and that's, of course, a very limited audience you reach. Uh, universities have responded to this, of course. We are not stupid as uh, scientists by developing new areas of research, for example, sustainability science. And we acknowledge that we actually need to make a better world in collaboration with people outside academia, like civil servants, like citizens, like NGOs, like businesses. But again, this is an academic exercise. And from a scientific point of view, I think this is absolutely fine. Um, but what from the point of view of changing the world to a better world? Do we not obliged as scientists, are we not obliged to take more action, to be more prominent, available, and present in discussions? Do we continue the rules under which sustainability science will take place, or do we really want to make a change? Do we continue to discuss adjustment to the current unsustainable systems, or do, or do we really want to try to make a difference to these systems? Do we continue to discuss the circular economy, or do we want to discuss the unsustainable on sustainability of the current economic system. I think that we as scientists should get more, even more so, out our, outside our academy and get involved more actively in the social debate. So it's about time for many more scientists, I think, to become scientists. And here, on the next slide, I have a short uh, definition of what I think a scientist is. Scientists are people that are engaged not only in scientific research, but also trying to promote, impede, or direct societal change. And that's the activist part. So, Turn, you're absolutely right. It's a combination of both being a scientist and an activist. And, of course, it can take a variety of forms. You can write letters, you can walk in marshes, you can uh, become political active, etc. Another thing I think scientists should do is also take responsibility for their institution to make the university or research center where they work more sustainable. A brief explanation on what I think a scientist is. There are different kinds of scientists, and just to illustrate this, I have a few examples. In the first form of a scientist, the scientist can act as a public intellectual, and his or her scientific work and social involvement are largely separate from each other. I think that Albert Einstein is one of the examples of these kind of scientists. His commitment to world peace and civil rights provide a good example, eh, because none of these things had much to do with physics, where he was an expert on. And he felt, Einstein, he felt that like any citizen, he had a role to play and he had a moral obligation to change the world he was part of. In another case, I think scientific research can be a direct starting point of scientivism. And here I have two examples. One is Rachel Carlson fights against DDT, as a biologist, she had access to a lot uh, amount of data, and she found out that DDT is very harmful for animals, nature, and humans. She then started an active campaign against the use of DDT, and probably you all know his, her famous book, Silent Spring. Another example of this type of scientist is Jane Goodall. 
Her research is best known uh, for a study on chimpanzees. And she found out that chimpanzees uh, are not, uh, uh, they are like many other human beings. They are capable of uh, uh, feelings. They do have emotions uh, and they have certain relationships. And that for her was a starting point to become a global leader in an effort to protect chimpanzees and other uh, animals and protect their habitats. Finally, uh, another type of scientist is an example by Edward Wilson. This is a mixture of science and social involvement. The ideals do not arise from scientific work, but precede it. I already mentioned that conservation biology was a good example. And this field of science assumes that the protection of such species is a good thing, and then calls upon science to assist in that. It also illustrates that science is not always a kind of objective something. It is quite subjective in this case. Well, I'm pleased to be here today, together with, uh, with Astrid and uh, Maurice and Teun. Um, and I hope there are many more scientists, scientists, and studentivists on the uh, audience uh, I see on screen. I think Einstein was quite right that uh, he, could appeal, he could appeal to a critical sense, a great reading and more awareness. But none of these, he said, were exclusive qualities of the scientist. By the end of the day, we are all concerned people who see that our current growth is not sustainable. We also know that there are good alternatives, and I think we need to fight for it, scientists as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Pim. That's, uh, now we know what a scientist and a studentivist? Yes. That's even better, <laughs> right? That's even, even cooler. But regarding my introduction, I, as a scientist, you have to constantly doubt. Can you also doubt as an activist, or does that make you ineffective as, a, as an activist? Well, um, as a scientist, I, I certainly doubt both on my scientific work mm -hmm. and my activist actions. Mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, I think it's, it's a healthy thing to doubt about the science you do. Eh? It's kind of a curiosity-driven work, of course, we all do. And I think uh, doubt also moves you forward in your scientific work mm -hmm. uh, to improve that, to make that more robust, to, to uh, look at it from different angles. And of course, there are also doubts at least I have, mm -hmm. and what actions I should take as mm -hmm. a scientist. Uh, should I become politically more active? Mm -hmm. uh, is it enough to walk like the last slides together with my students in climate marshes? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it enough for me to, to use my, my blogs as a kind mm -hmm. of a medium? Uh, so in that sense, I continuously doubt because it's also, and we'll come back to that later on, I assume, it's also sometimes a gray line between what you do as a scientist and what you do as an activist. Yeah. Because, of course, nobody here says there's overwhelming evidence, but there still might be some concerns that we have. And the science is not completely clear yet, but it does seem likely that we might have a climate change problem, right? Yeah, That's exactly. not how activists talk. No, no, no. So, so, and that's, of course, typically also uh, uh, more like how scientists and scientists especially talk. Mm -hmm. uh, they all explain their doubts because science, especially on complex issue, is never complete. There are always mm -hmm. uh, uh, limitations. There are always uncertainties. And that's, of course, this delicate balance yeah. you, you have if you are a scientist. Yeah. I think we'll talk about that in more detail later on. Yes. Now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Astrid Offermans, Associate Professor of Sustainable Development at the Master of Sustainability Institute, um, with a wonderful background in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary studies, uh, currently trying to use that transdisciplinary approach to get the community engaged with research into sustainability transitions, which of course brings in a whole other range of questions about how do you relate as a scientist in a community context, which we might talk about. But, well, could you kick us, kick us off? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Tun. Well, can scientists be activists? I mean, of course I would say they can, right? But should they also act as activists? And there I would say, I don't think so, at least not in their capacity as a scientist. And that's because mainly I fear that acting as an activist poses a serious threat to our uh, um, profession. And let me explain to you why I fear that or what I specifically fear and why that's the case. Let's see whether this works. Yeah, first of all, I fear an even further loss of societal trust in science. And I think I don't have to explain that. We all know that in a way that trust can and should never be taken for granted. It's also super easy to break and extremely difficult to restore it again. So I would say in order not to break it or not to break it further, it's very important that we as an academic community try to produce salient or relevant knowledge 
that we try to create credible knowledge, trustworthy knowledge, and that we do this in an ethical way. And ethics eh, has many different guiding principles, and Tun Dekker knows way more about <laughs> this than I do, for sure. But one important component of ethics is what we call independence. And independence basically means, means that it should be open to alternative assessments, and it should also remain open to change my point of view. Well, and, and I don't think that's what an activist or maybe even a scientist does naturally. You see the quote from uh, Metallica, they already uh, warned us uh, by the year 1991 with that. Nothing else matters. So I fear a threat for ethics and a threat for societal trust. Second, I also fear a race, or you could say a competition for charisma rather than academic rigor. I think that's also serious. Because what would happen if a scientist is supposed to convince rather than to analyze or investigate? How do we then still know what is the truth and who holds the key to that truth? I'm not sure. A scientist is basically someone who is practicing or using science for what they call or via Thoreau or, or, or systematic methods, fair enough. But it basically means it can be anyone affiliated to everything. It can be at the UM, it can be at Oxford University, but it could also be at Shell, at Exxon, or at any political party, right? And now, okay, again, we still have our independence that differentiates us, but what if we get rid of that? Now, to the audience, please think just a moment about a very good, very knowledgeable professor here at our university or beyond. And ask yourself, how good is this person in telling a very vivid, appealing, sexy story? Or let me say it in different words. Huh? If I allow myself, let's be honest, my boring, unflashy self, a place in the spotlight of activism, I also allow others this spotlight. These others may have different ideas. They may have less sympathetic ideas. And, and I find this very important, they may not be hired because they are a good scientist, but they may be hired because they are very good in telling and selling a story. And I'm, I'm quite afraid that I, and with me many others, will lose this competition between telling an objective, honest story and telling an appealing version of the truth. My last fear then, the third one, is that science becomes just an opinion. And I think this relates very closely to the role of the division between science and policy, especially in controversial issues. And I see that in my work, sustainability issues, um, they are very normative, you could say. And this means that there is great societal disagreement on the underlying norms and values. If you think about an issue like climate change, there is great societal disagreement on issues. Are we, is it real? If it's real, is it then a problem? How is it caused? Should we act and how should we act? Great societal disagreement. So we also know that even if there is consensus on the science, that's no guarantee that there will also be consensus on the politics. Because that makes sense, politics and politicians don't only look at facts, they also look at values and interests. And they cannot simply ignore these. And of course, that's a daunting task. That's very difficult. But at the end, that's where they are paid for, right? And I don't think they should look at us as scientists to do part of their job. No. So summarized, I would say that um, we should not become what Roger Pilke Jr. calls a stealthy issue advocate. And that's someone who is misusing science to negotiate for desired political outcomes. If that's what you want, I think that you should become a politician and not a scientist. That's it. Thank you, Astrid. So you teach a lot of students, right? Yes. In, in, in Masters in Sustainability, and they probably are, are quite activist. When you explain this to them, how do they react? How do you... Of course, when you're young, you really want to be the activist, right? Uh, many students want to be the activists, that's definitely true, but I think that they also uh, value science too much to become too activist within science. 
So they also see that an activist or a scientist can take different roles, including just the providing an overview of what we know. And we can illustrate, okay, if these are the policy options, to what extent are they in line with research results? What could that imply for the future? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the role that we have as scientists. And well, based on the discussions I have with students mm -hmm. in my classes, they at least don't reject this idea. There's hope. There's hope. For our third contributor, I'd like to introduce Professor uh, Maurice Zegers, who is at home at the moment, uh, suffering, well, certainly infected with COVID, but certainly not suffering, it seems to me, live and kicking. He is Professor of Complex Genetics and Epidemiology, uh, Chair of the University's Platform for Research Ethics and Integrity, and has a strong interest in meta-science, which is using scientific methods to study science, to look in the mirror, as it were, for, uh, for science. Um, Maurice, can I hand over to you? Thank you very much. Apologies that I would not, could not be there live. So I go uh, share my screen now. Yes, can academics be activists? I think um, to start with the end, I think the answer is yes. Because we can ask our questions uh, any, any other way. Can activists be men? Can activists be women? Can activists be cooks? I think uh, academics can, uh, can do whatever they want in their free time. And if they want to be uh, activists, I think uh, they, should, uh, they should do that. I see no... Uh, uh, contradiction between uh, the two terms. And coming back to also the point that uh, the Astrid made, um, scientists, uh, we are here, and that also is what we do in our uh, platform of resource integrity and what we stand for as a value as, as a university and as, uh, as scientists, is we are, it's all about finding proof. And um, but that does not mean that we can also uh, do something uh, that we are very passionate about. I don't think that if we uh, seek truth that uh, uh, scientists necessarily have to take the, uh, the path of, of independence. And that comes back to, uh, to the next statement. Uh, can academics work for stakeholders? Um, I'm an example of an academic who uh, sometimes works for, uh, for a stakeholder. I, at this moment, work for an, a law firm where we investigate a case on a pregnancy uh, medication and inborn uh, abnormalities at, uh, at pregnancy. And the question is uh, for us as um, an epidemiologist, forensic epidemiologist, to look at the forensic evidence and see whether the evidence that holds or underlies this case is valid or not. So in this case, I do work for, uh, for a stakeholder. And I think that could, uh, this law case is actually against a pharmaceutical company of which also uh, academics apply. And the discussion that we are getting is one on, um, on the scientific merits of the underlying research. And I think that's a good thing. Scientists work at stakeholders. They work at chemical companies. They work at uh, pharmaceutical companies. They work at uh, political parties. They, uh, they work at uh, stopping smoking campaigns uh, everywhere. And um, as long as the discussion is on the academic debate, I think that's actually a very good thing. Another point um, I would like to make is um, act activism means that we apply scientific research to society. So we could ask ourselves, can academics be policymakers? I think they should. They should, uh, they should not necessarily have to do uh, the research themselves, but academics can definitely be policymakers. And for that case, academics can, uh, can also be, I see academics, academics can be activists uh, as well in the same way that they really try to uh, use scientific research to change society. And I think that's what we are all about. 
And this last point I would like to make, if academics uh, cannot be activist, who else? Because I think my, my conclusion has to be that uh, not all scientists have to be activists, but uh, I think all activists should be science-based. Oh, yes. That was a, you know, a strong point. And I think it's sort of the Einstein point, right? Because Einstein was an activist, but not necessarily about uh, general relativity. So there's a, a division there that already sort of we can play with. You mentioned that, that you work a lot for, for companies uh, and, and then the value of independence becomes important. So when you engage with a company, how do you explain to them that, yes, I'm working for you and yes, I'm taking your money, but that doesn't mean that I will uh, tell you exactly what you want to hear. And that doesn't mean that I will tell other people what you want me to tell them. How do you have that conversation? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah the, the conversation, conversation is not that difficult, as uh, and maybe it was in the past. Um, the companies that, and I have to speak from my own uh, experience, the companies that I talk to, they want that. Because uh, as soon as you don't take this level of, and maybe the here independence is the right word, or integrity uh, could be the other, uh, the other word. As long as you don't assume that, you actually uh, not value uh, a thing. You have to be uh, independent and give your scientific opinion, uh, even if that is something that companies uh, don't necessarily want to hear. That's the value of academics. Mm -hmm. um, if I can continue on that. Um, so having two, two opinions, be both scientific based, is actually interesting because then uh, we all agree that we have to discuss on methodology and then, that, then we get this real academic debate. Mm -hmm. well, but it's a conversation that needs to be had, right? And people need to be, have a, be aware of that and, and be clear about the expectations there. Have you ever had to walk away? I don't think it's that simple that there's an academic consensus always. Mm -hmm. Okay, so have you ever had to walk away? Sorry, not doing this? Not yet, but I think I would. How do you know? That's the question, right? We all say that we would in, 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 in our living rooms. Yeah, but I think the, the, no, the, the, the question is, if, if you uh, ask for independence and you don't get it, mm -hmm. then you have to walk away. But that involves saying no to money, saying no to publications, saying no to things that are valuable, right? And that's, I think, the, the hard part. I think so. I think so. It has never happened that companies say no. But uh, I think you have to walk away then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Pim, we've sort of, well, you kicked us off. So, you know, I want to give you the right of reply here. When you look at these sort of more new, well, you know, these alternative accounts of, of the relationship between the two, how do you feel about those? Well, well I think uh, I heard uh, also both Maurice and Anasa saying something like independence and, and, and trust. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, both of these have uh, a bigger impact. So it's not only the science, scientist becomes an activist where trust issues play, where independence issues play. I think even a bigger picture arises that academia are being more and more financed by other parties. Eh? We mentioned the, the businesses and, and the, the, the private uh, companies that fund your research. I think even more so than being an activist as scientist, here trust issues play, here independence issues play. Uh, because I think if you are a scientist and you choose, and again, not everybody needs to do so, a plea for, for more scientists becoming scientists, but I fully understand if you're more comfortable in your academia, it depends also a little bit on your research topic, uh, but I think if you choose to become that, you choose it yourself, uh, unless you are maybe paid by an activist mm -hmm. community like Greenpeace or, or whatever uh, parties that also have this activist attitude are there. So, but I think uh, that's not really a problem for, for a scientist becoming an activist. Uh, I think these are also issues that are probably more uh, um, relevant if you talk about scientific research mm -hmm. becoming more and more financed by uh, external money yeah. with stakeholders that have a stake mm -hmm. and that actually want you to say something. Yeah, that's another constituency that you have to think about. Yeah, very true. Very true. Okay. We have a question from, from Trish who asks, we are seeing increased censorship of science sometimes driven by social media pylons, where findings that do not ally with activist meta-narratives, um, which might have impact in terms of publications. When certain questions and certain conclusions are off the table because they are, um, well, 
you know, not accepted by activist communities. Um, well, how can we nevertheless pr preserve our, our ability to, um, to speak the truth there as we see it? How can scientific journals, institutions, etc., prevent falling into this trap in doing so, compromising the objectivity and legitimacy of science? How do we do that? Asa, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that's a very challenging uh, issue, of course. Um, it definitely plays a role. I think one very important thing here is um, expectation management and also be very clear on the role you have as a scientist and the role you can take. And part of that role is that you should, I think, be open to mm -hmm. listen to other people. So don't immediately, immediately ignore them but try to get a complete picture, mm -hmm. there we go again. I think that's, that's crucial in here, to get a complete picture of the knowledge, but also on the values that are out there. Let's say we're very often dealing with normative mm -hmm. issues, uh, and that means it's very important to really understand all those different normative positions, because from there onwards, you can only start thinking about potential solutions, I would say. Mm -hmm. So don't ignore these people necessarily, but make sure that you include them mm -hmm in your full play of different uh, positions you consider in your work. But you know, there is this, this sort of nightmare scenario that I think many people who are, are scientists and who engage with you know, social issues in a, in a public way have to worry about, which is that if you say something that a certain community does not like, um, you, know, you will get 10,000 emails. Um, and some of those emails might not be very nice. Yeah. Um, that's something that you have to deal with as a scientist, and, and that's also something that, that as an institution yeah. we have to deal with because it's very easy for an institution to say, oh my God, there's you know, a social media campaign, there's 150,000 uh, signatures on this petition, we have to take action, right? which is, I think, perhaps a very impulsive response, but, but maybe not what you would expect from a university. So how can we, as an institution, make sure that, we're, that we support these people and also that we, we keep our values straight in the light of, of public pressure. Maurice, since you, you deal with institutional issues. Well, maybe a, a few things. Um, in, in terms of the social media uh, account, I think one is, I think it is, it is important that we as scientists also have our feet in the mud. In other words, we, uh, we need to understand what's going on in society. And uh, if a certain message gets brought broadcast it more than another message that, that could help us to, to, do, to do our research and maybe even take this role to, uh, uh, to, to valorize, as we say in the Netherlands, our, our research a bit more. Um, so it doesn't stop anymore at writing your scientific publication, submitting it, getting it published, and then let social media or let policymakers do, uh, do the rest. I think in this time, we probably need to uh, broadcast uh, the, the scientific consensus perhaps a bit more but also the other uh, the other way if if in, uh, we as scientists uh, see uh, uh, of have a new finding that goes against against the flow that we find it important we, we should also be courageous enough to uh, to sell that it, it co all comes back to uh, for me uh, the scientific rigor and uh, but, but also be ready to to not only publish but also broadcast that uh, that message i want to hear from you here do you feel sometimes under pressure by the activist communities in which you you move uh, yeah well yes of course i uh, um I think also in, in this discussion, uh, this is of course not, not as black as white as maybe people think, think it is. Mm -hmm. There are very uh, many shades of grey in, in, in that as well. Uh, I really like the point Maurice makes of social media, mm -hmm. which is quite uh, important. Mm -hmm. uh, I think also we need to realise that sometimes something happens outside of your control. Uh, if you say something out of scope, especially if you are being interviewed or you tweet something very uh, uh, quickly, uh, it can live a life of their own. Uh, but I think you, you should try to find a balance. Uh, that also goes for a lot of rules and regulations in place to promote scientific rigor, to have this trust in place. Sometimes these rules and regulations um, are, are losing the, the scientific uh, curiosity, the, the, mm. the passion people have. Uh, and for me, that also includes, if you are passionate for your, your work, you probably also are passionate to put it out there. Mm. Uh, to, to If you find something that's relevant for more people, that you 
are not thinking, well, okay, that's nice, I write a scientific paper. No, mm -hmm. you have then, at least I have, the urge to express that in, mm -hmm. in other ways. And we have more and more means over the years because mm -hmm. when I started my PhD, there was no such a thing as social media. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and of course, there's, there's also um, a danger in that. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the positive elements of, of being more engaged, uh, trying to be, of course, as trustworthy and independent and careful as possible, knowing that there are always mistakes to be made, mm -hmm. uh, as we are all humans. But still, all these things, I think, are more advantage than mm -hmm. not to do that. But, but if you, could you imagine that you have a, a colleague who says, oh, I've got this finding, and, well, there are certain activist groups who don't like it mm -hmm. and who will be very critical of it. Um, should I post this on Facebook or give an interview to a popular outlet about it, knowing that there's a good chance that a certain amount of hate mail will soon come my way? Well, that's, of course, a choice everybody uh, uh, can make. And, of course, if you know it beforehand, I probably also would doubt if I would, would do that because mm -hmm. nobody wants to be stalked by whatever kind of groups, uh, be it activists or maybe uh, other people uh, that has a, have a certain view. And sometimes you just don't know uh, hey, that you fall in that, well, not really a trap, but in mm -hmm. that, that, that uh, uh, environment. And, again, I think that's also part of a general issue. Right? You see mm -hmm. also policy yeah. maker yeah. politicians that actually have the same uh, mm -hmm. So that's, I think, a, a bigger problem, which is seriously enough. And I fully understand that that may, might limit your, your hesitance to, to, to be this activist. I think we need to teach people how to do that, right? I mean, if Maurice is saying this is a part of yeah. being a scientist in, in 2021, um, then that should also be included in how we, we train scientists in yeah. the PhD to be able to, to engage in that. Yeah, I fully agree. It's also a personal choice. Eh? Uh, by all means, if you are very comfortable in, in, in doing your pure scientific work, so let me say that, feel free to do so. Eh? Uh, because also Astrid rightly mentioned, I don't think everybody is willing or capable to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, you also see people that are, and that's actually also a, a righteous danger, I suppose, that if you are more fluid in your language, uh, if you have David Attenborough with his great voice, oh. it's a kind of an Einstein kind of guy that uses his scientific authority with his great voice to make a difference. And if I would present at, at the mm -hmm. conference of the parties, probably nobody would listen because I stumble, I stutter, my English is not that good. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, that's a danger. So these, these people get a bigger platform mm -hmm. than maybe more knowledgeable people that are less capable of. But that's, in science, the same. Maybe if I can, can, can add... Uh, I'm thinking of this, uh, I'm an epidemiologist and we have this corona pandemic. So uh, at every uh, occasion I get this, uh, this discussion. So what do, what do I think about uh, vaccination? And um, I feel that my whole family, all my friends are epidemiologists apart from me. So, um, and in a way that's positive. So uh, I think we see that society is using uh, science more and more and uh, to make up their opinions. But uh, I end up in these discussions that someone uh, pulls up one paper and says, yeah, but what about this paper? Or yes, what about, what about that paper? And I think we as academics, um, we have the duty to also put uh, this type of science in, uh, in the best perspective. And that comes back to the other point I, I was making in my slide. If, if academics cannot be activists, who will? Because, uh, and there I agree with Astrid, uh, and scientific argument has to be made, but it has to make sense as well. And for that, we, we need academics. Right. Who will not be in our case, in our corner, if we are not in our corner? Very true. Um, Asim, we were talking about this. We have a question from Elaine. How far do you think underlying ontological, epistemological, and, and disciplinary differences affect the side we take on this debate? Right. We've been talking a lot about objective truth, reality, independence. But of course, there's a, a large body of research in the social sciences and the humanities that says, well, actually, um, you know, there is no such thing as independence. We're all biased in, in, in a way. There's no such thing as objectivity. So let's just admit it. Let's, you know, uh, cut off the charade. Because um, the pretense of objectivity is perhaps more dangerous than honest subjectivity. Yeah, I fully understand that point, but still I think what differentiates us here is this rigorous and this systematic analysis of these things. Because indeed, we can discuss, is there one truth out there eh, that's reachable for us as scientists or not? I mean, you can debate about that. But you can also talk with indeed here, it's also called ontologies, uh, epistemologies. What approach do I take towards this truth that's out there? 
And do I as a scientist feel, okay, there is an objective truth out there to be explored by mm -hmm. me that I can observe from a distance, you know, analytically mm -hmm. analyze, fair enough. Others may say, no, there are different truths. According to the people you talk with, these truths may differ. Also fair enough, then as a scientist, I try to collect all these different interpretations of the truth. Again, others say, well, no, I can only discover the truth if I can become more of an, of an action researcher, right? So I have to experience things myself in order to be able to say something about it. And so what you see here, there are different ways in which we can approach the truth, I would say, as a scientist. But still, we do that in an academic way. And still, our goal is to capture what is out there and not to only capture part of what's out there or to sell it in such a way that we negotiate for certain political outcomes. I think that's the point that I say we shouldn't do that. Maurice, what's your thought here? Yeah, I think um, a, a good example from, from my experience is this, uh, uh, this legal, legal suits where you have two parties uh, discussing what, what happens there, but what I really like is um, um, you get, uh, so I as a scientist have to make an, uh, a report, an assessment of the, of the evidence. And then the epidemiologist from the other party also has to make a report uh, for a judge, uh, also uh, based on their opinion. Then we have to come together. We have to uh, discuss together uh, and make another uh, document where we uh, uh, write down where we agree to both of us and the point that we disagree and that goes to a judge and i think that's actually really interesting because um basically what we say is as academics we we agree on the methodology and that, that i think that's that's fair enough i think that's a very good point then uh, we have a common uh, common ground that we can we can work with But no neutrality for you, right? Because, of course, that's the idea, that we present ourselves as scientists as well. We have no sides, we are independent, we are unbiased, and, of course, we're, we're human as well. So should we just not admit it? Should we just dump the pretense? I think I agree to that. Uh, I think everybody is biased in, uh, if, if you have had an... Uh, disease or if you're a vegetarian or uh, something happened to your parents or I think that everybody's biased in a way but it does not mean that we cannot trust the scientific methods I think we can all agree and all scientists that we, uh, we are here for proof finding and we trust in the scientific method and that is what us uh, what us unites and then we can have an uh, academic uh, debate on whether these methods can be trusted or, or not. And I think that's a good, a good debate. Right. So I have here somebody saying in the chat, right, a scientist should always clearly indicate when she is stating uh, a personal opinion and when she's stating the state of the art in science. Do we agree with that? Do you want to explain that always? I would. And because also because it doesn't say that you should not be an activist, right? But not, well, at least that was where I would agree with, don't be an activist in your capacity as a scientist. Mm -hmm. So if you in the weekend want to go to the street and act as an activist, I'm perfectly fine with that. As long as you are not wearing your toga, for example, mm -hmm. and say, well, I'm here as a scientist, as a professor, and I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm exaggerating, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that uh, any of our colleagues is doing that, but to, to, to illustrate mm -hmm. the difference. Uh, yeah. Pim, can you ever make that distinction? Uh, well, I think it's very difficult to make that distinction. Eh? Uh, mm -hmm. And also sometimes it's been deliberately not being taken by the people that interview or uh, when you are in a, uh, kind of a, your, your status as scientist uh, automatically gives you a kind of a cr cr credibility, uh, credibility mm -hmm. even if it's not your, your topic. So in that sense, I would agree that if it's really outside your league, it may be wise to say, well, I'm not a virologist, uh, but this is my personal opinion about a certain issue. But sometimes it's probably more vague than that. And I also think on the other hand, uh, that's also the Einstein example, why not in some cases use your intellectual mm -hmm. power? Yeah. I hope we all have as a scientist, mm -hmm. uh, because I'd rather have a handyman uh, uh, painting my, my house than uh, probably an average mm. professor uh, or, or doing the, the gardening so because that is their skill mm -hmm. so in a sense of course some issues are just too complex to, to just have an easy opinion upon if it's not your field of expertise so in general say yes eh? mm -hmm. uh, don't be 
uh, tempted to go to uh, a kind of a television show on a topic where you have absolutely no mm. detailed information about because, well, you all see talk shows. Sometimes you see people just, well, you know, oh, no, no way. That's not the expertise of the scientist uh, on the panel. Uh, but uh, sometimes you just have that, that authority uh, where you, as careful as yeah. possible, say something about something outside your field. But of course, you have to sort of, Einstein is a fabulous example, right? I mean, fantastic mm -hmm. in, in terms of general relativity. Great in thinking about how light moves around the planet Mercury. But why does that give you authority to talk about world peace? What does he know about that? <laughs> no, well, it gives him authority. Like, why, why, why give uh, Leonardo uh, uh, DiCaprio mm. authority to say something mm. about climate change issue? Uh, but that's the whole idea of activism. I think his speech a few years ago meant more than all scientific publications mm -hmm. I ever wrote in my career, together with all my colleagues. <laughs> so, okay, uh, sometimes, especially if it's about issues where all signs are read, uh, and that's also coming back to an earlier question, that I do think it depends on the discipline you're working in. I'm mm -hmm. uh, working on, on climate change issue, and the first years of my career have been very, very frustrated because everything that's now out there well, it's already 30 years uh, known to scientists, but nobody listened. Uh, so, and that's strange. And now we see the impacts and you think, oh, if only we were able at that time to convince policymakers, mm -hmm. others, to take action. Mm -hmm. But nobody did because we are very dull and, and we only mm -hmm. wrote papers and made models nobody used. Uh, so, so that's, of course, depends on my mm -hmm. topic of field. And I can imagine that other fields where people do listen. Mm -hmm. I can imagine if you find a cure for cancer, people will listen. They will use it. Very likely, mm -hmm. I hope so. Uh, so uh, it, it depends on yeah. the topic you're working on. But if you take some charisma, well, maybe that's that's necessary sometimes, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And sometimes, if if, if a, a famous movie star uh, uh, says something that isn't formed, mm -hmm. uh, that can also help. Yeah. And of course, the dangerous they also can say something which is ill-informed, and then it doesn't help. Mm -hmm. So and that's that's the dilemma also yes. just mentioning as well. Yes. I've seen movie stars say things well, maybe they exactly have something on the, on the topic of personal opinion. I'm sorry, so here. No, sure. Um, what, what I think is, um, you also need to think of the the levels of uh, of evidence in in a scientific topic. So I completely agree. If it's outside your field, then it's always personal opinion. But uh, just the interpretation of science itself, uh, that's already a personal opinion. So we have data, and then we have interpretation of uh, of data. So um, it, it might be better to say. Uh, if you have an opinion of what instead of saying I have a personal opinion, maybe you want to say, well, this opinion is not really science based or the science is not that strong yet on this uh, on this topic. But I think this or that way. And that's exactly how uh, our policymakers sometimes have to make choices in, 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 in cases where the evidence is not strong enough. Right. But that creates pressure, right, on the scientists to come up with the answers politicians need. And there, too, we need to have the, the more. And we see it in this in this uh, uh, Corona debate uh, at this moment. But I think what what scientists can do is uh, also help non scientists uh, interpret scientific data. But that that's at, at least we as scientists are better suited to do that than uh, non trained uh, policymakers. So we should be teachers, not activists, right? We should be. I don't know, what would be the sort of contraction of activist and teacher? A tactivist? Uh, an, an, act an actor? Something like that, right? Maybe that's what we should be. We should be you know, activist teachers or teaching activists. Maybe that's, that's our role. Of course, sometimes the pressure is so big and the urgency is so big that maybe we have to loosen the rules a little bit, right? There's a question here from Ignas for, for, about for Astrid, saying basically that your approach, well, we should be neutral because that's a threat to science. Um, you know, how does that work when, well, there's urgency to act regarding, for example, climate change? I mean, you know, stuff needs to happen before 2050 where we blow up the planet. Is it really yeah. important for us to worry about our long-term credibility when the long-term might not actually be long-term? Um, I don't think the time frame really um, should make a difference. I thank you, Ignas, for raising this question because it also illustrates a little bit that my opinion may be not the most popular one. But I'm going to answer your question, Ignas. Would, would your view shift? No, it wouldn't because I think we have alternatives, right? So I earlier mentioned already this idea of a stealthy issue advocate, so someone who is using science eh, to, um, yeah, to negotiate for desired political outcomes. That's one, one option. 
Another option is to act more as what Roger Pilke again, uh, I steal it from him, uh, would call an honest broker. And what does an honest broker do? An honest broker illustrates, okay, these are the options, and in this way they relate to academic findings. So the alternative here would be, okay, given all the current knowledge we have, if we don't act now, this is how the future may look like. Of course, we have this uncertainty, fair enough, but it would have implications for biodiversity, for water availability, for climate extremes, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very powerful message mm -hmm. to policy again. So, and here you also see, and I totally agree with uh, what Maurice mm -hmm. said, maybe we are well suited to bring about this message and to help people to interpret, okay, what, what do these results imply? but we're not very good at communicating th these kind of things. And I think the solution lays more in better communicating mm -hmm. this rather than acting as an mm -hmm. activist. Mm -hmm. well, Tim, what's your view here? Yeah, well, well for, for me, uh, an honest broker is, is actually uh, a scientist. Uh, uh, and uh, if it's someone that's uh, collecting other science mm -hmm. from different fields and, and then tries to, to, to make a kind of a comprehensive message, mm -hmm. I think that's fine, but I also think that some scientific fields are probably only accessible to the real scientists, uh, so not like to a generalist. Eh? Like, uh, I work on climate change, but not a, a climatologist, so don't mm -hmm. ask me about complexity of the whole climate system. I only know kind of a, a, a integrative uh, health implication of that. That's, that's my expertise. So then, of course, with complex issues, then there's also a danger of that. And of course, we are only humans, so we have also dishonest brokers. Uh, so, so also people that actually uh, mm -hmm. uh, have maybe a different agenda or have just different point of views. Because mm -hmm. that's, of course, uh, a key point I would like to make, that some fields of sciences, uh, they are just not that clear cut. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if it's, it's pure mathematics, can imagine that you have just only one uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, hypothesis of Pythagoras uh, and not mm -hmm. uh, four or five different people trying to explain it a different way to the media. Uh, it's quite boring, it's not interesting, and it's there. But if you talk about climate change, the corona crisis, mm -hmm. the biodiversity issues, that's still quite vague, mm -hmm. also in terms of science, uh, but definitely in terms of what we need to do about it. Mm -hmm. And there, of course, that's, that's the gray area, where also uh, scientists need to be very careful uh, in order not to, to, to make their own subjective uh, arguments. Uh, so how do you keep yourself honest, right? That's, I think, the, 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 the question. What strategies can you adopt as a researcher to, to keep yourself honest. Yeah, well, well I, again, uh, it's, it's, it's I think more like like common sense and, and also knowing that it's difficult to remain honest. Eh? Mm -hmm. You try to be honest, but you also know sometimes you're honest, but you are not. But if you don't know, then you have a problem. Right, if, you you are, can... if you are deliberately dishonest, then of course it's a key issue. Mm -hmm. uh, if you deliberately sell a message, you know it's not true because you're being paid by or you have a hidden agenda, whatever. Uh, of course, that's a hot issue. And a scientist, mm -hmm. of course, I. I have no example of people I know in, in my career that have done that because then you just lose everything you, you, mm -hmm. you had. So I, I trust people in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, I think the key thing is, which was raised several times, uh, also to be honest about the things you do not know. Mm -hmm. uh, actually also the discussion again, if it's outside, way outside your field, mm -hmm. tell people. And then even then, people can just mm -hmm. leave that out and take your message still. Uh, although you have said it's not really your expertise. So what we really need is a sort of culture of honesty, right? In which, as an institution, we, we socialize people into asking these hard questions of themselves and each other. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, we, we talked about uh, education. Uh, uh, I think we, we need to uh, uh, train people on every level, uh, young scientists that are developing, or even older scientists. Because also at, at universities, of course, we are applying more and more rules because we apparently do not trust each other. And sometimes we then lose these rules because, you know, there are too many. Uh, but in general, I think that the majority of the scientists, 99.9%, .9 mm -hmm. uh, gets up in the morning trying to be an honest scientist. Mm -hmm. That's still my naivety, yeah. maybe, where I really believe in. Uh, and, and I think we also need to educate a bigger audience mm -hmm. because uh, we are... I'm probably biased because I meet people like you every day, mm -hmm. colleague scientists, but if you then talk to other people that are not familiar mm -hmm. with universities or academic research, mm -hmm. they sometimes have a completely different mm -hmm. picture of what science is, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. for the good and for the bad. Sometimes mm -hmm. they trust it too much and sometimes they, they trust it completely. So there's also a kind of elaborate education needed, I think. Yes, but of course, it's really hard to remain honest. Um, we recently had a survey, the National Research Survey on Integrity, in which 52% of, of surveyed scientists yeah 
admitted that sometimes they felt that they hadn't adhered to the highest standards of research integrity in a number of fields, not only in, in terms of honesty and independence, but in a number of fields. So if 52% of, of, of scientists sometimes fail to live up to the highest standards, there's a real threat to honesty. And, and Maurice, of course, we have this wonderful platform um, to promote this kind of culture of honesty. What can we do as an institution and as you know, people who have a, an example function and, and people who, who have, have staff who work for us to, well, promote this kind of culture of, of honesty? Yeah, uh, also thank you for that, for that question. Um, Yes, as, as a university, we take this, uh, the results of that survey, of course, very, very seriously. Uh, it's, it's not, in, in a way, not a surprise because it's it's not different than what we have seen in, in, in other surveys. I think there are uh, several roles you can take. Uh, now we are talking about the role of the, uh, the individual scientists and, and uh, the responsibility and you have as an as an individual scientist to be uh, to be objective. But I think there are two other. Uh, uh, aspects of that. One is um, the uh, the culture itself, and I think in, in the whole academic Dutch academic world, and also at the university, we are we are looking at uh, things like uh, erkennen en waarderen, uh, uh, how to solve uh, work pressures and the academic pressures. Uh, that that is a bit less. Uh, we see that, uh, and we have learned that from criminality. That uh, if you're in a situation that is uh, very low chance to be caught, but a high chance for reward, then, and then this type of behavior is actually uh, uh, stimulated. So that, that's something we want to change. But also we, as and now we talk about we as uh, uh, more senior scientists, uh, we have an, a critical role in, uh, in giving the example to more junior scientists, because much of culture is actually transferred, I think, in one-on-one -on -one meetings where you, as maybe a supervisor from the PG student, uh, give the example. So I think it's not only our role as a scientist, but also, I would almost say, our role as a mentor to show uh, how we deal with, with these issues. Mm -hmm. Pim, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, uh, coming back also to this, this institutional part, uh, I think that, uh, as I said before, that I think uh, scientifism goes hand in hand with passion and, and with, with eager to do scientific research. And of course, uh, the, the, the outlier, so this, this, this little chance of doing bad things to get big awards, uh, that for me is also part of at least the Dutch system and sometimes even the university system, uh, that you uh, are awarded highly if you get certain grants. Uh, that's usually not that innovative because uh, if you are too innovative, you just don't know what you want to do because that's not innovative. If you can write it down in 20 pages, uh, uh, that's for sure. But that's not awarded because you don't get uh, a proposal if you write just on the back of your envelope a great hypothesis. Nobody would find that. So that's being awarded. Uh, and then if you have one award, you are awarded the next award and the next award. So there's a very strong relationship, mm -hmm. partly to do with capacity, of course, but also to do with you are in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get that. Uh, the burning of teaching that also doesn't always allow you to go into maybe the depth of your science as you want to uh, we all have to teach and that's not decreasing as as we speak uh, uh, the, the uh, increasing need to attract external money mm -hmm. uh, it was of course different uh, way back but now you really are competing for that mm -hmm. money and getting money gives your status so i also think we need to uh, get rid of uh, several of these incentives mm -hmm. to 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 have that, but, but even with all these maybe wrong incentives to do the wrong thing, I still believe that none of us deliberately does that. Of course, you have always exceptions that, that, mm. that do that uh, all over the world. But in general, I think even with this pressure of teaching, with this pressure of getting still money, people try to be as trustworthy as, as possible, maybe losing the innovation because you don't have the time to really think and, and lay your foods on, on a table and have just a good glass of whiskey to, to ponder about science, but still, uh, I think uh, I, I trust science uh, very much, I must say. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's a very good thing. Yeah, um, maybe the, the survey, the, the, there was a lot of point of, this, of the survey because they also had questions on responsible conduct of research. And there actually the percentages were, I can't remember now, but it was like 98% uh, uh, of, of people actually doing a good, uh, good research. 
So the coin is on, on, on both sides. It, and nevertheless, it's of course something we want to pay attention to. But uh, I, I have the same feeling that that, that researchers are, uh, maybe people in general have that. People are good people. But, but people nevertheless, who, who sometimes stumble. <laughs> People nevertheless. <laughs> also, I have this question here for you from Suri. Hi, Suri, um, which I think is a really interesting one because she asks, can't the choice of research topic itself not be considered political or activist? And mm -hmm. the reason why I think this is an interesting question is that there is uh, the national code that has been agreed by the whole Dutch university sector uh, on research integrity. And one of the five key values is independence. Um, which, which you stressed. But interestingly, when you look at the description of this, this value of independence, it adds at the end, you have to be independent in carrying out the research, but in the choice of topic or even the formulation of hypothesis, you don't have to be independent. That sort of undermines your yeah. position a little bit, right? Well, definitely an interesting uh, question. Um... Two responses maybe to that. One response relates to what we've heard a lot here, that's passion, right? And I think it's also worthwhile to, to ask ourselves, where do we get the passion from? Do I get the passion to bring forward a specific opinion? No way, at least that's, that's not true for me. Where I get passion from is doing the academic work, is creating specific re research results in a specific way. And what the outcome is, you know, you never know in advance, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the trick. That's where the real passion comes from, at least for me. Okay. Next, what you say yeah, is the choice then for, for a topic. Um, can that be independent? Well, well, first, eh, how much choice at the end do you have? I think that's somehow limited, but let's assume I have an endless choice. Um, I, I think here it's really about the approach. I mean, I can approach any topic in an, in an open-minded mm -hmm. way, right? In an independent way, as you mm -hmm. frame it. Um, so I, I, I see where the question comes from, but um, the question would be, is there a topic that you can never approach in an independent way? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Maurice, any thoughts on the separation between we can be activist in our choice, but, but have to be independent in, in executing the research? I, th I think I agree with Astrid here. Um, this, uh, I, th I think any question, uh, I think it's also our task as, as, as academics to, to approach that in an, uh, in an, in, in an, as good as possible in an independent way. Uh, we are in a situation that uh, there are scarce resources, of course. And uh, if you look at NWO, there is a limited percentage that uh, is for research of any topic. And all the other topics are, uh, are directed. And they are, for example, directed in, uh, by the National Research Agenda, who, who uh, directs us in a way of uh, the type of research that uh, uh, the people in the Netherlands want to be researched. And uh, but with, that, with, that, with that, the, the breadth of topics is still so wide that uh, I think everybody of us can find their passion there. But the, the main question, uh, and I think I agree there with the research code, is that uh, integrity of research is not dependent on the topic you choose. Okay. And that is something that we can keep, keep separate, right? I think that's the, the key thing. And it's something that as a researcher, we always have to uh, keep in mind. Um, and it's a, it's a schizophrenic thing. If I look at my, my own research, right, I'm, I'm professor of liberal arts and sciences education, and I often announce myself as an evangelist for this educational format. Um, but that also means that I have to work very, very hard to make sure that when I interpret data, I'm not doing it from the narrative of, see, it's awesome. And that is a, a constant conversation that I, I have to have, which is why I often involve co-researchers who are not part of the liberal arts movement. Um, of course, the peer review system plays a part here, et cetera, but it is a, a constant um, a constant thing that we have to be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a challenge for all scientists because of course, well, we do have our passion and that's where that passion comes from. So it's, it's difficult. We have a question here from Kai. Does the idealized separation of activism and academia not assume a clear boundary between the two? Have broader political conflicts not already infiltrated science and academia? Are we already in a living in a politicized world? Bim, I see you smiling. No, well, 
Well, of, of course, science is part of society. So everything that goes on mm -hmm. in society, I think by definition also, mm -hmm. one way or the other, interacts mm -hmm. with, with science. I think it's not like it's something we as scientists are going to our work and then we are completely separate and then we, we come back and then we are part of society uh, again. So it's in part, it's, it's interwoven, I think. And I think also the example uh, Maurice gave that uh, has suddenly now there is an interest in climate change research mm -hmm. because we find it very important as a society. We see the changes happening whilst 20, 30 years ago, nobody would care less about that. So, mm -hmm. that's, so, so you, you see that already. Uh, and for me, uh, again, that, that's my opinion. I, I don't see that, that big distinction between being a scientist and an activist. Uh, again, this gray line. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's, it's quite much uh, influenced by political, societal develops, science in general. Uh, whether or not you're an activist uh, within the scientific community. Mm -hmm. But of course, there is already this politicization of science, right? Through the funding agencies, through what gets supported and not. Uh, yeah, yes, and, and results, I think. Uh, I, I recall, I think, a nice anecdote. And, and I think the media has a, a not to underestimate role uh, in this, I think. I recall when I did some work on climate change and infectious diseases, uh, journalists would call me and ask me, would malaria be a problem for the Netherlands in the near future? And I would say no. Then they would ask me, do you know scientists who think so? So, so, so you already see that, that, that sometimes you are being prone to these kind of uh, uh, mm -hmm. interveniences mm -hmm. uh, and then you can make, of course, a stronger mm -hmm. point in the, in the news because, mm -hmm. and that's also just part of society, meaning also part of science. Mm -hmm. But how do we deal with that? Because of course, this is actually fascinating yeah, when you're dealing with journalists. Yeah. Journalists were taught from the beginning, you always have to have opposing voices. Mm -hmm. You always have to teach the controversy. You always have to include things, which is why they ask, do you have anybody who <laughs> believes yeah, the opposite? Th that's, I think, the teaching also from, uh, for the larger uh, audience, because still, uh, if you still, especially in the early days, any climate debate had a pro and a con climate change. So people were thinking it was 50-50 in science, which is definitely mm -hmm. not. And still is the case. So you also need to educate, mm -hmm. I think, bigger audience. Be careful what you see in the media, mm -hmm. which I think is good for everybody for us to but realize. Media literacy is, yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. That's yeah, and if, if I can chip in, um, if, I'm, I'm not sure why this uh, statement was, was chosen. Can academics be activists? Because I think that's a really good statement. Um, it doesn't say can scientists be, be or professional scientists be, be activists? Because I see a role for academics also outside of uh, universities or where the, the professional scientists is being done. I think it would be really good. And I think that's happening now when journalists understand science, judges understand sciences, policymakers understand science. So I think academics should be everywhere in society so that this uh, academic debate that then uh, uh, happens is actually better understood. So yes, I think academics should be everywhere. Sort of going a little bit, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the sort of politicization of science? No, yeah, indeed. Eh? And, and, and I don't want to say that I, I, to a large extent I agree to what has been said, but um, we can be very critical about this and also what, uh, what was said before, like, okay, the research agenda at the end eh, determines kind of research we can do as academics. That's true. Um, but you can also have a more optimist view on that, mm -hmm. I would say, because at the end, let's be honest, we're all dealing here with tax money, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we also have an obligation to spend that tax money in, in a proper way. Mm -hmm. um, I would say one way of, of spending it properly is by producing salient knowledge, so mm -hmm. knowledge that's useful in practice, that mm -hmm. can be used by practice. Um, so, yeah, if you see it like that, I think it makes sense that there is a research agenda indicating mm -hmm. the things that could, could have a clear contribution to practice. And we have a question about that from Jan, right? Is it the panelists' view that the job of academics should be useful for society in a direct activist way. Um, uh, that's a, a position, right? Yeah. Jan apparently thinks not. Our usefulness consists in expanding our knowledge and our, our protocols differ in that sense from, from cultural, societal protocols of, of the politics and activists. So is that really, um, should we be useful? Um, we should definitely be useful, but it depends, of course, how you see yourself as being useful. I think Jan is right. Eh? I mean, uh, we are very optimistic here about science, but let's also be careful in not giving a too privileged position to mm -hmm. science, I would say, because I had this whole linear idea of we are producing science that ends up in policymaking and creates impact. 
I mean, 30 years ago, we were still thinking that it would work like that until we figured out, hey, all the research ends up somewhere at the shelf and, yeah. Yeah, and not a lot has been done with it. So I, I agree definitely to that part of uh, Jan's uh, question. So the, the, the question would then be, how can you be useful to, uh, to, to, to practice? Um, I always tend to say there are different ways to that. Uh, one is definitely creating impact with the research mm -hmm. you're doing. And you can do that in different ways. And I think one very important way that has been touched upon quite frequently in this discussion is by making sure that you better disseminate and better valorize mm -hmm. uh, research results. And so the communication part here, again, becomes very, uh, very um, yeah, important. But on this taxpayer point, yeah. uh, Maurice already mentioned that there's the National Wetenschaps yeah. Agenda, mm -hmm. uh, which is an enormous amount of money that is being invested in science, which is great. But, you know, the topics have very clearly been chosen mm -hmm. for, well, some, you know, societal relevance, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and, and usually economic social relevance. What do we think of an initiative like that? Should, would we, are we worried about that? Or do we think that's acceptable? Well, well if I, I may answer, uh, I, on one that, of course, especially if it's an area where you're working in, you find it acceptable because that gives you resources probably to apply <laughs> for. Uh, but that's, of course, the wrong answer from, uh, uh, from me. But in general, I find it a little worrisome. And also coming back to one of the questions I saw on the screen uh, is, is skipping below is that um, at this tax money payer, of course, we have a responsibility. I don't think that every research should be societal relevant because sometimes you just don't know at the moment. And also this activism part. So coming back to Jan's question, is probably limited to, to maybe specific people and specific areas of, of research, I think. Uh, but in general, I'm also looking at myself, I think most of us, I think many of us, uh, may have thought once in a while, what if I could do research in my own room uh, without any universities, deans, directors uh, uh, asking me teaching and these kind of things. So just being kind of this, this loose scientist uh, of course, money is an issue. We mm -hmm. all have a salary we need. But just having the freedom of your own to, to think about things, to ponder, mm -hmm. to do these things. I think, at least I've thought about, well, what if mm -hmm. I could do the same in terms of research, but without the meetings, mm -hmm. the, the teachings, the whatever you, you are, are, are needed to do. So in, in, in that sense, uh, also tax money gives you a kind of a, a string mm -hmm. attached as, as, as well, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's also the, the, the other side of the coin. We are never free completely to do what mm -hmm. we want to do. Maurice, National Wetenschaps Agenda, what do we think? I think that the system, we, we, we can have, of course, discuss about the, the topics that are that are in there, but uh, the system that, that we are, we as scientists are asked to solve uh, the most important societal issues, I think is a very good system. Um, but also that there is a percentage reserved for uh, any type of research that we, that we want to do is also a good system. I think we do have some problems in uh, uh, that there's maybe not enough money and we compete too much uh, uh, with each other. But in, in ideally, the idea that uh, society asks to solve important issues and, and looks at the scientists for that and uh, has tax money available for that, I think that's, that's actually a system we want. Potential um, uh, room for for well curiosity driven research. Be damned the consequences. Be damned if it's useful. I don't care where the crankshaft is. I just want to know. Yeah, and then we can discuss, also, of course, on this percentage. How, how big that percentage of that sort has to be. But in general, uh, I like that. Uh, I like the idea. There's of course also this question: not if scientists can be activists, but if they can be good activists and effective activists and how you can do that. And we have a question here from Arthur uh, who points out that climate scientists have been communicating about the future of our climate for decades um, when and, and it hasn't really done very much. We haven't been very good at it. So he concludes that clearly communicating the science alone is not enough to convince the public or policymakers. Um, so that raises the question, how can we be better activists? Um, should we not also talk uh, about values? and about humanity. There's a great deal of, of interest in the hard sciences, the sciences, technology, the engineering, the mathematics as being the people who have the answers, but well, all the 
communicating of facts hasn't been enough? Should we not have more activist philosophers in our talk shows and activist literary scholars who perhaps are more able to communicate? You know, since you're now dean of University College Venlo, <laughs> um, agree with that? Well, well I, I really think, and I think also the current corona pandemic is a great example that we are not doing the best, at least policymakers are not doing the best in science communication. Probably scientists themselves also, right? they are fighting each other, and, and that's also quite a confusing mm -hmm. thing for a lot of audience. And I also think, of course, we learn as scientists, right? coming back to the climate change issue, uh, which is part of my expertise, is that in the past, we just did the science, and then we throw it on the desk of policymakers or whoever wanted to, to use it, and the reason uh, nothing happened is because we didn't communicate. Uh, and that's, of mm -hmm. course, also a little bit Astrid's uh, comment. Uh, science has evolved. We, we are trying to involve other stakeholders from the start, especially in social relevant complex issues where you need to communicate, you need to also distract knowledge from mm -hmm. people outside academia. Uh, but, but still, uh, you see not much is happening enough. So that, that's also uh, the, the start of my plea that even are we trying to do our best, uh, sometimes I think that we as scientists are done discussing how many stakeholders should you involve, how should you organize dialogue sessions, uh, what is this community involvement. Uh, which is quite important. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a huge difference compared to early days. But still, if that doesn't give you the results that's needed, why not go a step further in writing letters, uh, being uh, active in, in mm -hmm. social media, uh, trying to, to, to make a difference? But does that also mean you know, going on reality TV or going on Dancing with the Stars? Or um, I'm sure you do great on Dancing <laughs> with the Stars, by the way. Well, Just I would think about the Mars Singer. No, well, I, I, I probably, <laughs> because then you have a Mars. No, I, I don't think you should go that route, at least my personal choice not. Mm -hmm. But if some people uh, are, are uh, seeing that as a useful platform, which I doubt it is. Um, but can you go too far in that, right? There are scientists who, can, who, yeah. go, um, <laughs> who go on to Dancing with the Stars or who go yeah. on to uh, you know, I think there was somebody in, in Britain who went on Big Brother because he yeah. thought, you know, finally I can reach all these people. I can be <laughs> in my Big Brother house. And while I'm there and, and you know, dealing with all, all that, I can also talk to the camera about the value of climate change and, and the dangers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Can you go too far? I think you can. Uh, and again, it's not my expertise. So I clearly state that this is not my expertise. But uh, I think if you talk about, about trust, that sometimes people trust you more if you also display some personality. So you talk something about your private life, but if you overdo that, mm -hmm. then you lose part of your trust because mm -hmm. then you think, well, hey, what has that to do with the field mm -hmm. of expertise? Yeah. But again, uh, I think that's, that's from practice roughly the case, and you certainly overdo your personally presence if you are part of Big Brother, I mm -hmm. think. But again, feel free to do so yeah. if you... <laughs> yeah. okay. But also, you deal a lot with, with communities, right, in your, in your research, mm -hmm. and you want to build up rapport there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to meet people where, where you meet them, where they are. Mm -hmm. So do you often worry that you go too far in trying to connect with them? Um, that's, of course, always a risk. Eh? And here again, it becomes very important that you, from the, from the beginning, are clear about the expectations and clear about your own role, for sure. Um, so that, that can be a challenge, mm -hmm. and you have to be open about that. You have to reflect upon it on a regular basis. Uh, but why I still do it is because I see this clearly as one of the roads towards creating impact. And I also saw it on the previous question by Arthur, who says, well, shouldn't we not look more into the values? And I think um, by collaborating with stakeholders within, but also beyond academia, from mm -hmm. the design phase of a project onwards, you, um, you allow yourself to get a more complete picture on the underlying challenge, I would say and the different ways in which that challenge can be framed. So a more inclusive approach, I would say. And you can jointly co-create also potential solutions towards that challenge. And I think that's, that's a very important thing because instead of always debating, okay, I disagree with this solution and I agree with that, uh, people sometimes forget to step, to, to take one step back, mm -hmm. right? And to really ask ourselves, why are we disagreeing? What are the underlying values mm -hmm. there? In that sense, I agree with, uh, with Arthur that that's definitely not something you should forget. Mm -hmm. Whether that's a risk because you engage too much, well, I'm very much interested. Again, here comes the passion to hear mm -hmm. about what are your values and why do you think in the way you think. That's where my passion comes from, not from giving more voice to some values and trying to neglect mm -hmm. others. That's, that's not fun for me mm -hmm. in a way. Ah, but we have a certain identity, right? And this is Francesca's question. Uh, do you think it's important to step back from the objective 
uh, ideal role of the scientist and examine our own personal inv in involvement in institutions and power structures and how that shapes our point of view. You know, we are by and large wealthy, healthy, well-off, uh, you know, tweed-clad uh, people of a certain kind. That shapes us. Mm -hmm. um, should we not also reflect on that? Definitely. And I think that uh, trickles down to what we also discussed mm -hmm. before. Uh, what incentives do we mm -hmm. have within our academic community to actually take time to reflect on these kind of issues? Uh, I think we, we are all able to somehow reflect on it, but there could be more because mm -hmm. I think it's quite important to, um, to reflect on, on the role you take to also, again, guarantee this, this, the credibility of the results we produce. Well, at least how, how independent can we be if we're all, well, people of a certain socio-economic, cultural background? And how can we as a university guard against that? I don't think we can. And we have to acknowledge, uh, keep acknowledging that. And what, what we as a university, but also uh, we as, as a team or, or a culture, uh, just keep, have to keep doing is uh, um, scientific rigor, that was, that was already said. And, and the other thing is uh, uh, transparency. Uh, show people what you have done, share your data, share your code, share uh, the, the, your, your background. That, that helps also people, people, other people who want to judge you can basically repeat what you have done uh, so far. That will guard us a little bit. I think the sunlight is, is a good disinfectant. I mean, of course, we're not, well, we are hardly doing research projects all on our own, right? I mean, if I look at the mm -hmm. past, there was no single project that I did on my own without any interaction with other scientists. So I think there is also a role for all of us to uh, challenge others to also reflect on this when, when being in a project together. Pim? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I fully agree. I think it's, it's uh, I think it's, uh, you are determined by where you come from, what your culture is, what your perspective is. And that, of course, influences everything you do in your life, including the science. And I was being, uh, I have learned that from the early stages when I did my PhD in climate modeling. Uh, we were split, it was a course uh, between the Netherlands and India. So we had a group of Dutch uh, PhD students and a group of Indian. And we got the same amount of literature and there was no internet at that time. And we were asked to make a simple climate model with some drivers. And then uh, the Indian group had the key driver of population growth as trying to influence that in order to avoid climate change. And the Dutch one was more on technology. So, so and the same information, uh, but different backgrounds. Yeah. We ended up with completely different perspectives in a very simple way. Mm -hmm. But it learned me from the, from the start of my work that it's so dependent. And of course, it depends on the science. I think some scientific disciplines are probably less uh, vulnerable to own perspective. But the more complex it becomes, probably the more social relevant it becomes, probably the more close it becomes to your own life in terms of risk, health, and, and, and things you see the more subjective very likely it becomes. So what's the number one thing, and that's maybe the final question for all our panelists, um, what's the number one thing we can do to do this at the university, to promote this kind of conversation and this kind of awareness and reflection at our university? Well, well first of all, I think it's, again, uh, important to maybe to have more meetings like this or to have uh, common courses where people are uh, allowed to go to. And again, I th personally, I think, it shouldn't be like sustainable development. It should be obligation for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Just enough people, discipline, scientists that could easily do without. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are not interested, why would you force something mm -hmm. upon them? Mm -hmm. uh, you can easily go. Well, into Nijmegen it. just did, right? All students now have to take this course on sustainability. Yeah, which I I, I, I think is great to have this course, but why should you force it upon on students? You can also think philosophy is maybe something all mm -hmm. students sh should get, mm -hmm. and most of them I do uh, get. Uh, uh, mathematics, I would think everybody should get that. We don't do, we don't do that either. Mm -hmm. And that's very strange for me being Professor Stanley Ludwig saying that. But I do think it's important to offer that for those group of people that are dealing with these issues. And I think a lot of students are actually wrestling with it, mm -hmm. especially I think students uh, we have in our classes working on sustainable development issues, on these kind of things. And you can train them and also the PhDs. Uh, uh, and, and not everybody needs to become a scientist or wants to become an activist or, or, or however you call that. But for those who mm -hmm. are, I think there should be opportunities at these universities to, to be engaged with this mentorship you mentioned yeah. before. It can be quite important. And again, 
I have no answers either. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't have a kind of a, well, you need to do these 10 things in order to become the perfect scientist or whatever. It's just trial and error to a large extent, I think. Astrid? Yeah, what can Where I do add we go from that? here? Yeah, I think what is very important is it, it all starts with a kind of acknowledgement, right? And I think what, what I learned today is that's probably more important than I thought before to clearly communicate science and also to better communicate that uh, there is a specific way in which you should deal with research results or a way in which you should interpret research results. And I think that's, that's very important. So to acknowledge that as a community, but also maybe to train us slightly better in doing mm -hmm. that. Uh, it also been said, well, we are communicating already for ages, so we don't communicate enough. Yeah, the question is, are we not communicating enough or are we communicating in the wrong way? Mm -hmm. And the yeah, next question would be, what, what would then be a better way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mask singer or I, I, I don't have an answer to that, unfortunately, but I think finding an answer to that should help us forward in, uh, in this discussion. Great. Maurice, where do we go from here? Yeah, I, th I think at the university, and, and we already do a few things. Well, one is we, we do want to stimulate good, re uh, good culture of, of research. And as, as Pim said, this, this meeting and this type of discussion is a very important one. This is also a discussion I would like to stimulate uh, at the coffee table. If, if you have uh, um, meetings with, uh, with your colleagues again, or at the beginning of the end of, of, of Zoom meetings, unfortunately right now, um, we organize some theater plays. And hopefully, we can invite you to those again. Where also these discussions are are being done. Really, what we want is that we on on regular moments talk about uh, talk about these uh, these issues. Science has changed. We are in society. I think it's a good thing that that we are in so in society. Science itself is is more and more in society, which I also think is is a good thing. And. Uh, Yes, we, we, we do try to, uh, to get the policies uh, in place to support all this. And these policies are always a bit behind. It's open this, open that, and uh, all important. But um, yeah, by, by also talking about it and stimulating this culture, we hope that, that we, as a group, uh, as a scientist uh, ourselves, uh, keep having these societal issues in mind as well. Thank you. We started this presentation, this event, by thinking a little bit about the tension between understanding the world and changing the world. And if I reflect on the discussion that we had, I think we conclude that there is a tension there, a tension that raises many, many questions. And we don't think that you can be a scientist only by trying to understand the world and just pretending that activism is not your business at all. But neither do we think that you can be a good scientist by only being an activist. Um, and, and only being just another participant in a political discussion. And so, for all of us, the challenge as we go on in our scientific work is precisely to, to walk that path, to find that balance between doing justice to the values of science and what makes science different from other forms of knowledge, from what makes science special, but also to take our responsibility as people who operate in a, so, in a society, in a social ecosystem, who have a responsibility by virtue of their position and their abilities, and who want to ultimately find and use their passion to make the world a better place. And that is a conversation that we continually need to have. We can foster it in all kinds of ways through education. My word of the day is teachtivist. I think that's <laughs> what I'm going to put on my business. Thank you for that one, Pim. Um, to be honest with each other, to always have the conversation and to create a culture in which we reflect on these dilemmas like we have done today. I'd like to thank the Maastricht uh, Platform for Community Engaged Research, our platform for research ethics and integrity. Uh, an event like this takes a lot of uh, time and effort to organize. Maurice, thank you so much, and uh, yo, get well soon. Astrid Pim, thank you so much for your time. I'd like to also thank the wonderful people at Science Vision who put on such a good show. They make us look good, and we're very grateful <laughs> for that, but you never see them, so shout out to them. Um, as we go on into the Christmas period, let us keep having these conversations. Let us think about what it means to be a scientist, what's difficult about that, but also let us try to remember how, what a privilege it is to be able to do this work, 
to be able to engage with young people to further these conversations and to use our passion and our talents to make the world a better place. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and stay safe.